Well, we're in the Big Ten, and uh, boy, the first few weeks, Connor did a great job, and Robbie did too, and uh, I've been wanting to preach this message for over a year. I didn't know we were going to do the Big Ten when Andy was on sabbatical, but when he announced that he was, I said, I want number four. Um, The reason is, I discovered a sermon uh, early spring last year, I was writing, uh, going through a sermon podcast I go to a lot, and uh, I heard a sermon on the Sabbath, on work and rest. And it just nearly ruined my, my bike ride because I discovered I'm not a very good Sabbath keeper. And for someone with 40 years in the ministry, that wasn't a very encouraging barometer of my spiritual maturity. I've probably listened to that, I don't know, eight or nine times this last year. I've sent it to everybody in my formation groups and so forth. Um, and so I want to share with you some things that I have learned this last year as I have tried to become a better Sabbath keeper. And I hope that uh, our text today will resonate with you just as these others have uh, and the six more that are yet to come. But I think it's important for us this morning to come to this commandment with some fresh eyes. You know, typically, most of us, when we hear the Sabbath, we think, oh boy, it's been a great hard week. I can't wait to get to the weekend. Oh man, I got to keep the Sabbath. I got to go to church. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you have ever felt that feeling about Sunday, that is not what the Sabbath is about. So I got good news. That's not what the Sabbath is about. So you have a chance to rethink, reformat some of your uh, neurological stuff up there and get a hold of what I believe the Sabbath meant for us. Let me point out some things contextually that you may not have noticed, uh, but if I can draw your attention to it, you can meditate it and think about it this week. This commandment is actually a bridge between the ten. The first three are, of course, getting God right, worship only the Lord, don't have false idols, don't take his name in vain. It's all about get your life under God's authority. Get that clear. And then we're going to, the next six sermons will be about relationships with those primary people in our life, what to do, what not to do. This one here, you might say, is the commandment, yea, the gift to us. It's a gift. It's it, at the least a benevolent command. It's the one that has commentary. You know, thou shalt not commit adultery. Not much commentary there. The Sabbath has two more verses of commentary, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But it's an important that we think of the Sabbath as actually a gift that most of us don't think of as a gift. We think of it as oh, one of those Sunday duties, messes up my day. I could be out there golfing, I could be shopping, I could just be on the veranda, wherever. So I hope that you will jettison this sort of keeping the Sabbath as going to church. Keeping the Sabbath might include going to church, but it includes a whole lot more. And in just a couple of texts, I think I can help you see what that more is. And if you get your heart and mind around it, like me, you're probably going to feel convicted. I'm not apologizing. You know those Reese's Cup commercials? They talk about Reese's. They go, sorry, not sorry, Reese's. (laughs) Well, Sabbath, I'm not apologizing if you get convicted because there is a rest, the Hebrew writer says, waiting for the people of God. But they often don't take advantage of it. Many of us don't. I'll speak for myself, but I don't think I'm far off where most of us are, that we probably violate this commandment as much as any of them. Mostly without knowing it, due to our very limited view of Sabbath keeping as going to church. Um, But as we shall see, it involves a lot more. I want to share some facts with you before I read the text. Fact, this is stuff I pull from a variety of sources. Americans are the most workaholic people on the globe, perhaps in all of human history. The information age has not set us free, but it's actually shackled us to a work we can never seem to get away from. Long ago, our culture passed up Germany and then Japan for hours worked. According to the International Labor Conference, we work 137 more hours a year than the Japanese, and they are really busy people. 137 hours is almost three weeks. Well, it's actually a little more than three weeks. The Brits, we work 260 hours more than the British. That would be about six weeks more a year. That's a month and a half. And of course, for our French brothers, it's about 500 more hours than they do. 
That's like a whole three months off. They have a sabbatical every year just by taking three months off. That's why their productivity is kind of low too, but we won't go there. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics report that we have increased the average productivity of the American worker by 400% since 1950. Now, I don't know if it's good or bad to say, but this, I grew up in the 50s. I was born in 58, so this has happened in my lifetime. If that were the case, we should all be only working 11 hours a week. Or our lifestyle should be four times greater than it was in 1950. And certainly we would say there's been some good improvements since the 50s, for sure. Uh, maybe some of those improvements haven't always been so helpful. But in any case, our productivity is not giving us rest, the promised chip, the computer that was going to make life easy. Ha! Huh. What a sales job. It's not made it easier, it's made it exhausting. Consider these headlines. America's workaholic culture needs to end. Melissa Gates at the World Economic Forum, September 2017. Here's one from February. Derek Thompson in The Atlantic. The religion of workaholism is making Americans miserable. A final one from June 2014 in The New Republic. I'm, I'm kind of getting magazines from all over the, the spectrum. Workaholism in America is hurting the economy by Bryce Covert. Now, I could go on. There are nine more Google pages. You know, Google page is about 18 inches long if you print it out. On and on and on. Anybody who works at labor, anybody in mental health, physical health, education, uh, labor development, this is now documented. We know the problem. We overwork. So clearly we have a serious need in America as believers and as citizens to relearn the deep meaning of Sabbath as taught and exemplified by Jesus. It's amazing to me that in all these articles I peruse for quite a while, our culture has a clear, articulated understanding of a problem. But I only found one article from 2003 that actually suggests the solution. Back in 2003, a Jewish woman who worked for the New York Magazine, her name is Judith Chulevitz. She wrote an article, this is 16 years ago, and it says, bring back the Sabbath. <clears throat> and in her article, which I can't read much from, but I recommend it to you, you have to Google to find it. She talks about one of Freud's disciples who came up with a theory about um, Sabbath neurosis. People trying to be so assiduous to keep all the rules of the Sabbath that they actually got sick and dreaded the Sabbath. But she realized in her hectic, she'd left Judaism at 12, was a typical secular New Yorker, busy urban woman, got to fill every minute of every day, even the Sabbath day. And what she began to realize was <clears throat> she had a different problem than fearing the Sabbath. Here's something she said. On the weekend holiday observed by all present-day civilized humanity, Ferenzi was writing in 1919 when Sunday was still sacred, even in Budapest, his very cosmopolitan home, not only did drudgery give way to festivity, family gatherings, and occasional worship. Now listen to this. This is incredibly insightful. But the machinery of self-censorship shut down too. The machinery of self-censorship shut down too. Stilling the inner, the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. I'm going to get to this in Matthew in just a bit when we read the text. But I want you to think about the fact that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's a command as well as a benevolent gift. Judith, even as a lapsed Jew, was discovering that my life is out of control. Maybe I need to bring back the Sabbath. And she goes on to talk about uh, how she had this full-blown problem and she just dreaded the weekends. And so she came after a while... Um, I got lonely and did something as a teenager profoundly put off by religion I could never have imagined doing. I began dropping in on a nearby synagogue. <clears throat> she talks about the fact, uh, I sat in the back of this Disney-fied sanctuary built very much in European style that I had no interest in praying, which I hardly remembered how to do. What I wanted to do was listen to the hymns, which offered the uncanny comfort of songs heard in childhood. 
For 84 years since Frenzy identified his syndrome, which bears a striking resemblance to what is now called workaholism, as it's become the norm, and the Sabbath, the one day in seven dedicated to rest by divine command, has become the holiday Americans are most likely never to take. Let me read to you from Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Now there's something, God Almighty, resting. We'll have to come back and see what that means. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. We could preach a whole series on God's blessings. God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. If I can add some commentary. For those with eyes to see and ears to hear and wisdom to embrace. <clears throat> it's interesting that this one command includes two verbs. And I'm going to break those down because I really think that is the way we get our arms around keeping the Sabbath. The first one is remember the Sabbath. I want to talk about why ways we forget the Sabbath, what we forget, and what Jesus teaches us about the Sabbath, and then we'll go to the keep side of the Sabbath. Why are we inclined to forget the Sabbath? The verb remember is a clue to this inclination. We are inclined to forget. Now, don't, don't sit here and get all righteous on me. Adam and Eve, before the fall, forgot not to eat of the fruit of the tree. That wasn't even five chapters. It was one chapter. The first couple, untainted by sin, forgot the one most important thing to remember. Do you think we're any less culpable now after the fall? This is a command given to Moses, and it goes back before Sinai to creation. It was really a gift. We're inclined to forget, just like they do. You know, it's amazing how some of the most important things we forget. And then when we call, come, come up on them again, they bring such a sweet thing. I, my mother passed away some years ago, and I'm still plowing through. You know, if you've been through this journey, you end up with stuff that you, it's too good to throw away. You don't have any place for it, and you know what to do with it. And then finally, you reach a point where it's like, i got to put this back in circulation. Someone surely wants these snow globes. My mom's got, I got boxes of snow globes. If there's snow globe lovers here, we need to talk after service. <laughs> But as I hold those snow globes, I remember, oh, yeah, I remember the Christmas we got her this one. Oh, I remember we were on vacation, and she saw that, and she just had to have it, and we, we got her that one. And the remembering that comes from things. And the Lord has blessed one day in seven, and he wants us to be able to come and remember, oh, it's Sabbath. Oh, I'm finally here. Sabbath, rest. Now, ways we forget the Sabbath command, um, we're easily deceived. Adam, of course, was deceived. Cain was deceived, messed up his offering, ended up killing his brother. We'll come across that command later. Abraham, remember Abraham's problem? He couldn't remember his wife from his sister and feared that he was going to have be killed and his wife. He said, well, she's my sister. <laughs> Better keep the brother around. But twice he did that, and his son Isaac did the same thing with Rebecca. Sins of the fathers, you know. It's easy for us to be self-deceived in well-meaning, even religious observance in matters. We're no different than those guys. King Saul did it when he was commanded to kill all the Amalekites and he messed up. David, when he didn't go out to war and he looked at Bathsheba and committed adultery. Do you really think we're much different than them? We forget the Sabbath. We substitute counterfeits for the Sabbath. One is busyness. If I just keep busy enough, I won't become aware of that inner murmuring that maybe this last week mattered or maybe it didn't. That self-reproach that feels like we've never done enough. Maybe you're, you're one of those people who's wholly balanced and blessed. God bless you. You should be up here with me telling people how good it is to be that way. 
Most of us, I have find, don't need condemnation. We got a conscience in our head that is constantly condemning us. Now, the Lord doesn't do that. The Lord comes and affirms us. His spirit convicts us so he can remind us, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've died for you. I've done a finished work on the cross. We have a wholly different opportunity in him. We become the righteousness of God, which means the rest of God, resting in him. But, but it eludes us. We forget about it. We substitute it. Instead of taking our rest, we stay busy. Or maybe even some of our folks watching this morning at home, I can totally relate. Some of you have had such a hard week, you're crashing. I've had, you, I've had you tell me that, Lord Pastor, last week. We just stayed home. We tuned in. We were so exhausted. I believe it. I totally do. And then sometimes we're just distracted. Please give me anything but silence and quiet and peace and solitude to hear myself think. Yesterday I had my earplugs in as I was cleaning the yard before Daniel came with his son and fished in the pond. I had to get the weeds the other way make a good impression on my brother. And when I was bending over with these plugs, I could hear my heart beat. You know, it could be that some things we need to do in this culture is put some spiritual earplugs in so that we might rediscover that spiritual heartbeat that God wants us to feel and hear and be in touch with. He knows the hair on my head. I'm pretty sure he knows my blood pressure right now and yours, and your spiritual condition, your restlessness, your lack of silence, your exhaustion, your pain. Well, what, what do, is it that we forget about the commandment? It's pretty simple. We forget, in spite of it being a benevolent gift, it's a command, not a suggestion. It's one of the big 10. Now, what that tells me, since we can make clear case that this is a gift from God, God realizes our ability to forget and to be distracted, he has to command us to do a good thing. That should underscore the significance of the Sabbath command to our well-being. It's not just about church going. It was established, as I said, in creation. It was Sinai in Exodus 20. After four years of being slaves, they didn't get a day off. They didn't get to go to Sabbath in Egypt, I'm quite sure. At least after Joseph was gone, they were, they were slaves. And one of the things that the Decalogue gave them back, as, as well as a moral code, was you're going to have a sabbatical every week, a time to remember, a time to rest. Give your donkey a rest. Give your servants a rest. Give the sojourner who's with you a day to remember, to look back at what God has done, to tell our children about it, to look forward to the next week, to realize someday, you know, the Messiah will come. For us, someday, he will return. So we have the same opportunity to reflect back on the history of salvation, our history of salvation, where we are, where we're going. Whoever does that anymore? One of my favorite things to do is to calm people down and get a hold of their wrists and say, give me a spiritual diagnosis of where you are. Most people can't do it. They haven't taken the time to do it. They don't have a regular time to say, I mean, they can tell me they're exhausted and anxious. I can see that. But we don't know how to do the self-soul care for which the Sabbath, at least, was partly created to allow us to do and to have the kind of community that can help us. Now, this command, this gift, was modeled by Jesus. On the seventh day, God completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh from all his work. Then God blessed it and sanctified it because... He rested from it. And in Luke 4, 16, and Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, as was his custom, so he was a churchgoer. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. So we have both the, the Heavenly Father creator and the Son as the Redeemer, both practicing Sabbath keeping. But you have to wonder, why does a God who can't get tired rest? Rest has to be more than just ceasing from working. It certainly includes that. But for God to rest, the clue is in the creation account. And God separated the light and the darkness. And he said, that was a pretty good day's work. That was good. Let's get up tomorrow and see what now we have day and light. Next day, well, let's have plants and trees. Let's put birds in the air. And day after day, he'd say, that was really good. Then he made man in his own image. He goes, ah. 
that was very good. And then when he made woman, the English, my brother will tell you, does not do justice to what the Hebrew says. The men went berserk. Whoa! <laughs> God, you did really, really, really good with this woman. That's a hint, men. You need to say that at lunch today. Just remind your wife. Whoo, God, you did really good with this woman. Have you ever taken time, and do you have a time on your Sabbath when you look back and say, that was really good? I have to be careful today because a friend of mine's here, and I'm going to, I don't want to embarrass her, but this week I got to do true religion. What's true religion? To remember orphans and widows in their need. And I got to help a widow this week. I'm not telling you who. I don't want her to tell you. I had the pleasure, the pleasure of using my hands to do something for a widow. It brought me deep satisfaction. And I know it made her really happy too. Because it's been annoying her like crazy. Like a pebble in her shoe. And I can totally relate to that. You know, I'm embarrassed to say probably a year ago, I would have been too busy to do that. What have you not done this year? Because in the lack of really Sabbathing, you don't make space for prayer. Too busy to do small group. I don't have time to read the Bible. I'd like to read that thing on marriage and become a better husband, but I don't know when I'm going to do it. And on, on and on. We, just, we can find reasons not to do the beneficial things God has promised with a blessing. It's just like tithing. You know, the reason we... Most of us who tithe, we get our $100 this week, and we take 10, and we give it to God, and then we go live on the 90. And we live fine, and life is good. We get, but we don't know how God helps us because of that discipline, but it works. And he says the same thing. I want one day. I want one 24 hours. You give it to me, and I promise to bless you and to make your life different. We're called an attractional church. Our model is that we can attract people to the goodness of the gospel who kind of have maybe a really jaundiced, unbiblical, untrue view of God, all kinds of crazy stuff from our culture. We hope they come in here and we can show the truth about God and they'll be attracted to who he is. A key to that is how you and I live. I got a clue for you. If we could all purpose this year to learn to Sabbath better. I believe the attractional quotient of crossroads would jump 10 or 12 points on the scale. Could you agree with me to do that? I want people, it says so many times in scripture, when they see the good works that you do, they'll glorify your Father in heaven. One of the good works is to enter into his rest. And yet we avoid it, we forget it, we dilute it, we substitute it. Because we're free now. We're not under that old Jewish thing, that legalism. We're not like the Puritans. But careful now. When you set a day aside, that's what it means to set a day aside, to be holy, to be sanctified. It has to be other. So we have six to do this. Is your seventh day really other? I got a confession to make. I work on Sunday, so this is not my Sabbath. I don't pretend it to be. I don't need it to be. But I had never faithfully substituted a real Sabbath. And I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing to you as your pastor. I've not been a good Sabbath keeper. So if you looked at me, you'd go, I probably better not Sabbath like Pastor Gamble. And you would have been right. But now, after about a year of repenting and practicing, I can say like Paul, follow me like I follow Christ into his rest. And you'll have time to do true religion. You'll start finishing books you started and threw under your coffee table. You'll start stopping to take notice of sunsets. I'm a coffee snob. You'll take time to just enjoy all the stuff of making good coffee. Food, community, having a relaxed time at a party rather than, I've got to hurry and get here, and I've got to go another one. You know, even the things that should bring health, we often come so anxious and, and, and worried about tomorrow, unable to physically, internally discipline ourselves, we don't even suck the manner of life from the things we often do to give us life. Can someone please say amen or am I just talking to myself? Yeah, I, I thought we were more alike than different. Well, let's look at this thing that Jesus says, which I hope will set you free. In Mark 2, and it's actually in the other Gospels, Matthew has a version of it and so does um, uh, Luke. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields and as they made their way, the disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees, who I guess were following along, you can imagine why, 
We're saying to them, hey, look, what they're doing is not lawful on the Sabbath. And Jesus, in a very calm demeanor, said, that I'm just putting that in there. I'm pretty sure he was calm about it. And he said to them, have you never read what David did? When he was in need and hungry, he and those who were with him, how they entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence which it is not lawful for any but priests to eat. And then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. When you and I resist what seems to be legalism about Sabbath keeping, it's from a pharisaical mindset. It's not from a Jesus mindset. You know, most of the complaints they gave to him, this is just one, most of them were because he was healing on the Sabbath. Now, according to Jewish law, a doctor could only do on the Sabbath something that would save a person's life. If you had a broken ankle, sorry, come back on uh, Sunday. Can't do it on the Sabbath. And yet, Jesus was restoring people's arms. He was healing the blind. He was getting up the lame. He was healing on the... And for him, it was like, remember in John 4, the woman at the well, the guys go get lunch, they come back, and they're eating. They say, Father, uh, Jesus takes some food. He goes... I've got food that you don't know about. And they go, man, did someone bring him lunch already? He said, I have food you know not of to do the works of my father. That is my food. So on the day of restoration, Jesus was about restoring people. And I wonder, do we have restorative disciplines in our life? One of the things we're trying to do here, the white card Daniel just went through, you know, I need prayer. I've got people praying for you this morning. I'm praying for some of you. I've got some notes from the white cards from the last few weeks. Prayer is incredibly restorative. Sometimes we come up forward and we weep, we lay hands on each other. It's a powerful restorative discipline. Fellowship. I love our big lobbies and the coffee. I see people come early and they get in the corner and they catch up on the latest week's stuff and plan where we're going to go to lunch today and something this week. The Sabbath was made for us. We don't have to jump through a lot of legalistic hoops. We are free from that, but we are not free from the need for inner and external disciplines to help us leave the six days and truly enter into the seventh, whichever day the week needs to be. I understand there are policemen here working today, like the pastors. We have people in the hospitals. Uh, My daughter has to work some weekends. So we have to learn to discipline ourselves to take care of the Sabbath rest when we can't get it on Sunday. There's an interesting passage in Isaiah 57 and again in Hebrews where it says, there is no peace or rest for the wicked, Isaiah 57, 20. And in the book of Hebrews, it goes on and talks about um, how the Lord forbade those to enter into his rest because of their disobedience. And there's a rest for the people of God, but they often ignore it, which makes us comparable to the wicked. The Lord said, I'm not letting those wicked people ever have the rest I have for my people. And then his own people don't take advantage of the rest that's for them. And you got to think God's going, I'm not letting the wicked have rest, and yet you're my people, and you won't take advantage of this benevolent gift. No wonder he commands us to kind of pull a little more ump into the party for us. Well, he healed on the Sabbath. They went out to eat. Um, They had soul time. They were quiet. I bet they laughed. They probably caught fish on the Sea of Galilee from time to time. He taught. What do we most need to do on the Sabbath day is to learn. There should be some learning time. That's why we do Sunday school, why we do small groups and evening. It's amazing. A lot of the things we're doing are very ancient because they work. We have to remember who we are in him and whose we are, his, and not the world. We need a a 24-hour fast from our culture. Surely someone can give me a witness. I see a brother. Give me a witness there, brother. We need a fast from the ridiculous treadmill, secular, never say stop, business as usual, 724. We need to say, no, that's not me. I don't belong to that world. I belong to the kingdom of God. In his kingdom, we take a seventh-day rest and get restored, and get blessed, and celebrate what we have, and look forward to what we're going to receive. 
And we want to draw other people into it by taking time for parties and communion and cookouts and such things. Well, let me give you some thoughts on how to remember the Sabbath. How can we remember the Sabbath? First of all, in your mind, retract your mental thinking that the Sabbath is a gift, not at Sinai, it was a gift at creation. If you believe that you were created by God Almighty and you were made in the image of God, part of that image is you were designed to have one day off in seven for him and him for you and with each other, family, friends, community. Relearn the Sabbath as a gift. Create reminders. I, love, I bought my house from a dear brother for, um, and we had the best time. We prayed, had a handshake, made an offer, counter offer, it was all done and they wanted a missions person to buy their house, so it was just a sweet story. But he left some things in that my house I'm so delighted at. Every entrance, there's a little metal thing clamped to the door. And inside is a scroll with the Ten Commandments on it. Every time I go out my door. I'm reminded of the Big Ten. There's a plaque that says from Joshua, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's kind of to let Jehovah's Witness know who lives here, but um, <laughs> sorry, I had to put that in there. If Jehovah's Witness, listen, come on, we'll talk. I'll tell you what that means. But, you know, the ancient Jews, if you kids, sometimes you might get it from their literature. You see these guys with these leather straps, and the Torah was there. That means the law controlled my actions. They tied it around their forehead, and the law controlled their thinking. And they put it on their doorpost. The law controlled this little sanctuary called home where God and his will reigns. So, put some reminders up there. Put a reminder on your phone. I have now listed on my phone, and my assistant is incredibly jealous to help me protect my Sabbath. And sometimes I can't get it all in one day, so I'll sometimes do a 12-hour Sabbath and a 12-hour because that's the way my schedule works. But when I can, as often as I can, I take a 24-hour Sabbath. And I have to tell you, if you're like me, you're going to need Christian brothers and sisters to encourage you when you start doing it because you'll feel guilty for about six months. Kept thinking. Man, I'm looking at all my friends. They're working themselves to the bone. And here I'm, I'm actually resting and getting rejoiced in the Lord, finishing books I should have finished and praying for people I never had time to pray for. And now I do. And I'm remembering hymns I, from the, the older. All of a sudden, I'm just enjoying the Lord. And I'm kind of feeling guilty but it'll pass. You'll quit feeling guilty yourself and you'll start praying and feeling sorry for them. Nothing, I tell you, almost nothing our culture needs more now than people who know how to rest and know how to bring other people to that rest. First of all, in relationship with Jesus and then in this gift called Sabbath. And then the last thing I would say to help you remember is plan your Sabbath all week long. Andy's on sabbatical, as you know, and next year I'm, is my um, sabbatical. And I'm already planning my sabbatical. And the reason is part of the joy of looking forward to that time of finishing another book and writing a curriculum, visiting family, resting, playing, doing stuff in my house, seeing people I've not seen. The planning and looking forward to it is part of the, part of the joy. And all week long, are you planning your Sabbath? Hey, we should get a dinner together. Let's plan to have dinner with these folks on Sunday night. Hey, maybe we could do this, get ready on Saturday, and make Sunday morning a unique thing. Maybe watch online somewhere with some lost neighbors who are open to seeing what we do here at Crossroads. You can plan your, sermon, your Sabbath all week long, and you can put it on your phone reminder. Somehow redeem that little aggravation. All right, got to quickly run through this and then we're going to sing a wonderful hymn. The first verb is to remember because we're want to not. The second one is to keep, to keep it holy, which means set apart. We've already kind of talked about that. Let me give you some inner and external disciplines that I think become necessary to keep the Sabbath once we begin to remember it and what it was meant for. Adopt the principle of sabbatical into your life. Go back and read in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the second law, after they went through the 40 years because they didn't go into the promised land, now their kids are ready to go in, Deuteronomy, second law, 
and you get into the details and you realize the seventh year, the land was hell follow. And the Jubilee year, all debts were forgiven. You know what that did for God's people? I realize we're a capitalist economy and we don't have the mechanics to necessarily make that happen. But we can say we trust in the Lord for our provision. Yeah, we work, we save, and we should. But we are not running pell-mell into the future, working as hard as we can because we think we'll never have enough. I really pray for my immigrant brothers and sisters. This is a common blind spot among immigrants. When they come here and they've come from such loss and they're sending money back home, they just don't take time for rest. But all of us can get caught up in that. We need to build Sabbath into our thinking about our, what we have and not be so focused on accumulating of wealth, but trust in the Lord. Adopt your own blue laws. I won't go into detail on this, but there was a time when we had blue laws. They come from when the Puritans were here, they literally wrote it on blue paper and it stuck. Go Google blue laws. Our culture's long since given them up. When I was in grad school, they started folding and people started working. You could get liquor on Sunday, the stores were open. Now we just extrapolated everything to seven days that worked just fine in six. Write your own personal family blue laws. So those are some external things you can do. Here's some internal things. Begin to see Sabbath as more than attending church. And I, I could get shot for this, but I'm just going to be honest with you. Some, when I have been in really deep, hurtful, painful places, there's been times when the most restorative thing I did was not go to church. But I did Sabbath with Jesus. Ministry can be that way. Medicine can be that way. Police work can be that way. Business work can be that way, where you just need to get away and Sabbath with the Lord up in the mountains, down at the beach. There's nothing wrong with having a special time. It's not a good, ha it's not a habit, but sometimes it's necessary. And I want you to know some of my most restorative Sabbaths have been when I took a week off from church. I don't do it often, but I've done it, and I recommend it if you need that. And then learn Sabbath rituals for you and your family. Worship is a part. Vocation is work. Avocation is play. Are you planning any playing? Any recreation for your Sabbath? And then do you have some time for solitude and science, a silence? I want to recommend two books for you, one by Ruth Haley Barton. Ruth Haley Barton. Three years ago, my spiritual director recommended that book, seeing how hyperactive I still was. And I began reading that book, and the best part about the book is called Invitation to Solitude. At the end of every chapter are very simple, practical exercises. And over, I took my time, I read like a chapter at a time, I didn't read straight through it. And I found myself finally learning, now longing to get to that time of the week I've set aside to be quiet. I'm so confident now when the Lord speaks to me because I'm not busy talking and I'm not busy thinking. It's taken me months of intentional effort to shut up in God's presence so he would know I'm giving him und undivided attention. And when we do, he has a lot to say. And I know you want to hear it. Much of it is affirmation. Much of it is encouragement. Much of it is healing and direction and wisdom. I pray that you will learn to do that. A second book is a book simply called Sabbath by Dan Allender. It'll take you a while to get to it, but it'll be well worth your trouble. Be accountable for Sabbath time. Most of us need someone to say, hey, Daniel, are you really keeping your Sabbath? And let's talk, get, let's get into some detail. Hold me accountable. Maybe it's with your spouse, maybe it's with your small group. There's some jobs where it's impossible to keep a Sunday Sabbath. That doesn't get you off the hook. It's one in seven. Remember, we're in the kingdom, we're free. We're not legalistic, but that gift is there and you need to claim it. And find or look into building a Sabbath community. This is what our small groups hopefully are, what crossroads can be a part of. <clears throat> in closing, I've got this beautiful hymn and it goes with what Tyler said earlier from Psalm 4. One day in the presence of the Lord is better than a thousand of the joys without him. We're gonna sing, is it well with my soul? Can I ask you a really simple question? Is it well with your soul?
Is it well with your soul? The world knows the problem, and our Father knows the medicine. Let me pray for you. Lord God Almighty, Lord Jesus the Magnificent, both of you taught us the importance and the blessing of Sabbath. Today, we really have a repentant heart right now because we know we're not the best Sabbath keepers we should be or the best Sabbath keepers we could be. So we confess, Lord, we have broken this commandment, not once but many times. Would you forgive us right now, Lord? We just together say, God, have mercy on me, a Sabbath breaker. But Lord, have grace on me to become the Sabbath keeper you've always wanted me to be. And let us leave here without shame and guilt, but with resolve and hope and encouragement to keep the Sabbath holy. We ask this in your name. Amen.